I was going to wear my panda hat again, but uh, you know, I've worn this at like multiple talks, and, and it always is. But this is actually a serious talk, right? So, so we're not going to wear, we're not going to play the panda masquerading as, as Chinese APT. I want to talk a little bit today about security exclusions, right? So, um, and ultimately how to do, how to write better security exclusions. By the way, if you are a hardcore detection engineer and you write endpoint exclusions all day long, there's another talk going on, and, and it's a much, much better place for you to be, right? Um, this is a fairly, I don't want to call it a fairly, like, basic, basic talk, right? But I've done a lot of these talks at Wild West Hackfest where, over the years, where I, I come in and uh, I end up prefacing the talk with the, you should probably be in the other talk, right? You should probably be on the other stage, not watching me. Um, and they end up being some of the more impactful ones. Uh, I'm hoping this, this runs kind of the same gamut there. Uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, just to get us uh, get us kind of going here, I'll throw the who am I. I work over at Scythe uh, doing uh, threat intelligence stuff, really adversary emulation. I don't like create IOC feeds or whatever. I was called a digital terrorist recently, and uh, that has to go in your bio, right? When, when somebody publicly calls you a digital terrorist, I mean, how does it not? Um, but uh, yes, and uh, if you add blockchain to a software solution, I think we're largely done with that, like with the, the whole blockchain craze, but whew, man drives me absolutely batty, right? When people try and add, needlessly add stuff to a security solution um, like, uh, like that, right? Um, so I do wanna talk about security exclusions today, right? And introduce a model for prioritizing how to write better security exclusions, right? Um, we'll talk about the model, the equilateral of exclusion risk. By the way, I know that that's, uh, I know that's dumb here, but I'm, I'm pivoting off of great successes like the pyramid of pain, right? And I know that if you're gonna create a model, yeah, it has to be small, it has to be compact, and it has to be definitely easy to spell, right? Oh, wait. Um, so anyway, um, we'll talk about a couple of gotchas uh, in writing some security exclusions, and I'll wrap up with a couple of closing thoughts. So when we talk about security exclusions, they are just a reality for most organizations, right? So um, what is a security exclusion? Right? So if we've got an EDR or a SEM or any endpoint control for that matter, and to be honest, this doesn't just need to be endpoint controls. Right? When we talk about security exclusions, it could be network controls as well. Um, but the reality is that, that for our purposes here, we're going to be talking about security exclusions almost exclusively on the endpoint. Right? Um, so network, network, uh, network security devices uh, are treated a little bit differently, and they don't lend themselves as easily to uh, you know, writing a, really a model for prioritization here. Uh, the reality here is that a lot of detection engineering teams can build, build good use cases. Right? But, a lot of these use cases, they create way too much noise. I speak from experience here, right? I took down a large hospital network one time, right? Um, just, just, a, just a small multi-state hospital network, and uh, they weren't able to transmit any, like, just confessions, right? Um, by the way, if you work long enough in security, you're gonna break a lot of stuff, right? And if you ever have one of those moments of, like, huge imposter syndrome, where you're like, oh my gosh, right? Real ex. If I knew what I was doing, right, this never would have happened. And okay, well, maybe that part's true, but none of us know it all, right? And the reality is that you're going to make mistakes. And I have tons of these, right? But I'm willing to tell you here, in trying to write a security uh, detection rule, I did. It definitely detected. I tested it. I tested it, and it worked exactly the way I expected it to in the lab. It definitely detected the thing we were looking for. It also detected a lot of legitimate traffic, like all of the legitimate traffic that was being sent between a couple of, we'll call them patient critical laboratory systems. And, you know, this is one of these things I like to call a resume updating event or an insurance invoking. So anyway, so whatever the, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the role here is. But um, the reality is you can have a lot of noise, right? And this, need, this means ultimately you're going to need some kind of exclusion to say, well, not on this system, right? Or, or maybe if I need to apply a detection rule more broadly, I'm, I'm leaving the scope of don't apply it on the system and maybe writing a better rule in the first place, right? And so exclusions can be thought of as a false positive reduction tool. You have a detection that works, but you have way too many false positives. Or again, for instance, just hypothetically, that's not even hypothetically, you took down a hospital network, right? And that's why you need exclusions. So by the way, please don't take down a hospital network, right? This is not an endorsement of that. This is the, you know, people make mistakes, me too, right? So the reality is that most organizations don't have full-time detection engineers. Um, I, I pitched this talk um, and even the model to a couple of smart detection engineers that I know, um, and they were like, yeah, no joke, right? Like, they're like, you don't need this. I'm like, no, you don't need this, right? You're a full-time detection engineer. Most organizations don't have these, right? 
And so if you don't have detection engineers, or I mean, some folks call these like level two SOC analysts, right? They're not detection engineers, they're the person who's been here longer than six months, right? And they're the one writing the use cases. Hey, look, that's the reality in most organizations, right? They're the ones writing these use cases or simply using out of the box, right? Whatever comes with the EDR, whatever comes with the SIM. And they get the new update and they're like, woohoo, let's apply this use case. And, and either it generates way too many false positives and they eliminate it entirely, right? Or then they let it run, right? I, I, wanna, I wanna kinda note here that by writing good exclusions, right? Um, we can go ahead and leave those detection rules in place, right? Um, so that they are generating the right amount of, hopefully, right, a manageable amount of alerting. I feel the need to discuss briefly here the security haves versus the have-nots, right? Um, I, I, would, I would note that anybody sitting in the audience today, right, is, is either here on your own dime, right, or you are somewhere above the cybersecurity poverty line, right, where the, that's what I like to call it, right, the cybersecurity poverty line, right, um, where you have an organization that is investing in you, right? Now, again, if you're here on your own dime, that's a whole different thing, right? But, um, you know, again, one, awesome you, right? Go you investing in yourself, right? And by the way, if your organization didn't pay for you to be here, right? I'm not saying you need to find a new job, but I'm definitely saying I would move someplace where, I don't know, right? My organization is investing in me, right? Alas, um, <clears throat> look, uh, you know, again, if you have an organization or you are an organization with full-time detection engineers, you don't need the stock. That's the reality, right? Um, this is really for the rest of us, right? Um, so I will mention here, security have-nots that are left to implement whatever the simplest possible thing is. And I think we all know what happens when you combine simple with security. Um, generally, that doesn't work. Historically, that hasn't worked out so well. Well, it works out very well for incident response firms and not so well for everybody else, right? And so I wanted to highlight a couple of examples, and these are not hypotheticals, right? These are all examples of things where I needed a security exclusion. I've got some custom developed application that's critical to the business, right? It uses some weird licensing routine, right? Because they don't want you to ever, you know, for instance, take it and install this thing on more computers than they, than they authorized you to, right? And so they've got this licensing routine that's super obfuscated, right? Well, obfuscated code also sounds a lot like malware, right? The reality is that most commercial software isn't heavily obfuscated. And so the EDR is like, whoa, 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 that looks malicious, right? Who in here has heard, heard of VM Protect? Let me deal with VM Protect or a malware analyst that. Yeah, there we go, right? So VM Protect is a commercial tool, right? It's a commercial tool. It's built to do exactly this, right? And this particular example is VM Protect, right? And so, but as it turns out, right, there's a lot of malware, right, that's written by VM, or sorry, a lot of uh, malware authors use VM Protect as well um, to ultimately obfuscate their code. And it is, it is very, very effective. Either gentlemen ever reverse engineered anything in VM Protect? No? Either you want to? No? Yeah, me either, right? It sucks, right? It is just, it's one of the worst, like, well, worst and best simultaneously. If you want to protect your stuff, it's one of the best things out there. Um, if you have to reverse engineer it, it's, uh, yeah, it's time to change jobs, right? That's actually something worth moving jobs over. It's like, you have to reverse engineer this. I'm like, joke's on you, I've got an offer letter, right? Um, so at this point then, I have to go in and figure out a way to go and create an exclusion. Another one here at a major sporting event venue, right? That sells a commemorative screensaver because they don't allow people to come in and take photos on their property. So they sell this commemorative screensaver, but during installation, right, it binds itself, it creates an actual, uh, reads the machine ID, right, so that, uh, well, it's an anti-piracy thing, or an anti-copy protection, or what have you here. Um, so the hash is different for every screensaver on every machine because it's tied to the CPU ID. Well, now I can't even do a hash exclusion, right? So uh, I can't even say, well, it's this hash, right? It's not digitally signed, obviously they didn't, I shouldn't say obviously, some people are that stupid, but they didn't include the, the signing certificate, for instance, the code signing cert in the deployment program, right? So I don't have a digital signature, the hash is different every time. I got another business critical application that updates frequently and updates all the time, right? Like sometimes multiple times a day, and it creates a read, write, execute section of memory. The gentleman who was just up here earlier, he's like, yeah, and when you create an RWX section of memory and then put a bunch of code in there, that gets picked up by the EDR every time. And I'm like, yes, yes it does, it totally does, right? Um, and, and what do you know, right? So it's detected as malware by the EDR because it freaking looks like malware. It's doing things that malware does. And, and to be honest, most legitimate applications are, are never going to do, right? So 
talk quickly about models, right? Um, I have a love-hate relationship with models. I don't like to be boxed in. As a, as, as a out-of-the-box thinker, and so I like to think of myself as an out-of-the-box thinker, I think most of you probably do as well, right? Um, we generally don't lend ourselves well to being boxed in and saying, well, follow these steps, right? Um, but, but I do want to briefly talk about models. Models introduce academic rigor um, into areas where, where we don't have it otherwise. Um, I do want to note that I do a lot of board engagement. And, and if you'll allow me to detour for just a minute, I want to note that the vast, ma vast majority, maybe vast majority is too much. How about a simple majority of board members think that we're making everything up? Because any sufficiently complex system is indistinguishable from magic. And I think that if you don't understand the underlying technology, and your board members definitely do not, right? The vast majority of them, there's a vast majority. The vast majority of them definitely do not understand the underlying technology uh, that we deal with. Um, they, they, what they hear a lot of the times is, give us more money, right? Give us more money, more money for security. And we're like, but didn't we give you more money last year for security? And, and why are you back? And anyway, um, we have a credibility problem in InfoSec. Anytime you have a chance to use a model, use a model. They introduce, again, academic rigor, right? It's not simply saying, hey, here's what I think. Here's why I know this is correct, right? Um, what you're able to say is, hey, here's what other people think are correct, or other people think is correct, and now I'm pivoting off of that, right? So again, it builds in some credibility, some social proof, what have you. And also, again, it kind of removes that idea of you're just making it up. I'll also throw out here that, you know, in the early 80s-ish, right, financial analysts, right, they had the same problem. They were, by and large, not using models, right? So by and large, they were kind of, well, making stuff up, right? And we all know how that kind of went with the big 80s, uh, you know, stock market crash thingy there. Um, but alas, uh, you know, as they introduce more models, we get more consistent results, right? And I want to throw out here a note that, you know, one of the big things that we get out of an idea with, <clears throat> with using any model anywhere, and I'm not just talking about this one, but, but any model anywhere, is the idea that multiple different analysts can look at the same piece of data and arrive at generally, or the same set of data, and arrive at generally the same conclusions. And without that, what I have is lots of analysts arriving at lots of different conclusions, which sounds a lot like to the board, like we're making stuff up, right? And again, we want to avoid that. I do want to highlight here as well, this assumption is greatly exacerbated by the fact that many of us do not hold the degrees that our board members think are so critical. Now, I'm not here to spark the, do you need a degree for cybersecurity? Should you have a degree? Do you need certifications, whatever? Right? I have lots of opinions on this, just like I suspect everybody else does. But at the end of the day, we're not here to have that debate, and you shouldn't. I don't want to have that debate with my board members. I don't want to have to show up with a PhD to have credibility in front of them. Right? But by doing stuff where I'm using external research, right? not just some dude's blog post somewhere, but like actual external research, anytime I get the chance, it's done. Right? Again, I can move the... <clears throat> I can try and move that discussion, uh, move that discussion away from the do you need a degree, right? So, again, academic rigor just matters in cybersecurity, and and it's okay for you to disagree. I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, right? We all have our different opinions. You can disagree, but you're wrong, right? You just are. You're wrong. You should be using every tool at your disposal, right? Every tool at your disposal to focus on fighting the threat actor, not your internal management, not your uh, you know, again, not your board, not your stakeholders, right? So, um, I also have independent validation that, that this is actually necessary. I work with IONS a lot. Uh, IONS is the Institute for Applied Network Security. I hate the term expert. I just hate the term expert. I, I can actually see a couple of other IONS faculty in the audience here and around, um, but uh, they have this term called ask an expert calls, right? And again, I hate this term because I, I hypothesize that cybersecurity is so broad, right, that none of us are actually experts. We're experts in like some little tiny niche thing, maybe, right? Um, that's actually one of the great things about IONS, by the way, is that they shift the, the right calls to like to the right people um, so that like I'm not answering questions on the wrong thing where I'm absolutely not an expert. But I've had a lot of calls on this, right? Where folks are like, hey, I'm getting these, all these false positive alarms and I just disabled all these rules. And I'm like, no, no, that's a bad plan, right? 
They're, or sometimes the call is literally, should I go disable all these rules? And I'm like, no, right? I worked in incident response two years ago where they had a great industry-leading EDR in place. They had had a problem with some developer machines um, that were creating uh, some, well, during the compilation process, right? Some stuff was getting flagged. Um, and uh, somebody went in and put in a security exclusion, right? Sure enough, they excluded start.exe. That, that, was, that was a losing move. I mean, to be fair, it did eliminate all the false positives. <laughs> Mission accomplished, right? By the way, this organization doesn't have a full-time detection engineer, right? Now, by the way, that one was not an IONS client. That was an incident response. I want to separate these two here very quickly, unless you think I'm talking about one of our clients. Um, but the reality is here, I've talked to several Fortune 500, matter of fact, several Fortune 200 organizations, right, that no joke are asking some questions that I think would, I wish I could repeat some of the questions verbatim because I, I think we'd all get kind of like a, oh my God, that's the actual state of the industry uh, space here. But uh, again, um, some folks have come to me and said, well, Jake, if you just write the rule so specific, then you won't need an exclusion at all. And I'm gonna fight you there too, right? The reality is that, you know, in most cases, right, um, we can get to, well, I have finite time regardless, right? So even if I spend way too much time crafting the perfect rule where no exclusions are necessary, yikes, right? Um, I probably am not doing, well, I'm not getting to other stuff that I need to be working out detections for. So exclusions are necessary. So I want to introduce the EER, the security exclusion model. I love this little graph. I actually subscribed to a couple of graphic services, and uh, I was, I, I basically searched for the word bypass, and this came up, right? And I'm like, this is like the perfect graphic when it comes down to, because you've got a nice wall there, and then again, it's like just drive around the wall, climb over the wall, what have you, right? Anyway, the EER, right? It's the equilateral, equilateral of exclusion risk is a model that we've developed for demonstrating the relative risks of different exclusions that we can go apply to endpoint security controls. And yes, I know equilateral is hard to spell, but I was trying to come up with a good acronym because marketing loves a good acronym, and there are only so many shapes that begin with E. I thought about an ellipse, but that's just like a, it's circular, right? And that wasn't gonna work out very well, so, so here we are, here we're stuck, right? Um, so <clears throat> when I'm faced with the need to go write an exclusion, the idea here is that we use the exclusions that are the highest on the EER model and are supported by my endpoint security tooling. Now the EER addresses, or the ER, ugh, actually I've never actually said the word ER before, but we're gonna go with that. The ER right, addresses creating the best detection rule exclusions on a given endpoint or for a user or for a group of endpoints. I will note here, by the way, the simplest exclusions, right? The easiest way to get from point A to point B is often simply to exempt a particular endpoint, which is exactly what I did for the hospital network, right? I was like, oh, those endpoints that are shipping that critical data, let's immediately remove them from, you know, for, from that particular processing. I want to also note here that this doesn't apply at all, right? The ER doesn't address that at all. It just assumes that you've already done that and you're now still left with a rule that's overly specific and you need to create exclusions. So a couple of key principles, right? Um, key principles that kind of drove the, the development of this model, there are always some activities that cannot be detected reliably without some exclusions built into our detection logic. I will note here that every exclusion introduced has some risk of bypass. I hope that this is not in any way, shape, or form um, controversial, right? Uh, there are a lot of red teamers, I suspect, in the audience here um, who I, I'm, I'm pretty positive would be like, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. If somebody leaves me in, I'm going to take that, right? Toehole, I'm going to take that. Not all categories of exclusions introduce the same risk of bypass. If, for instance, right, I say only exclude things with this digital signature, I think we know that that's better than star.exe, for instance, right? Star.exe being, being kind of the bottom of the barrel there as it goes. Optimal exclusions may not be supported by the security controls, right? I have to play the hand I'm dealt. Well, at least until the licensing comes up for renewal, right? So I have to work with whatever the tooling I have available is. Um, I'll note here that detection engineers should select exclusions with the lowest risk of bypass, and as controls are updated, exclusions should be reviewed because, as it turns out, what are the odds, right? Uh, security vendors both add and remove features regularly, right? Um, or in some cases, push an update that disables a particular feature. Folks, actually one more point here that I'm gonna rant on for a second, and it is that you have to do regression testing with your security controls. This is why you need good, regular purple teaming, right? If you are not doing regular purple teaming in your organization and, and you have the time or resources to do it, you need to do it. I have worked tons of incidents where people tell me, oh yeah, Jake, we, we definitely, we tested that. Let me back up here for a second. 
where you bring them the results in the incident response. And you're like, hey, here's what the threat actor did. And they're like, no, no, you're wrong. I'm like, OK, why? Why do you think I'm wrong? Right? And they're like, well, our security controls would never allow that. And we tested it on the last purple team exercise. And, and so it definitely didn't happen that way. And we're like, well, OK, we get to ground truth. And the answer is, yeah, they really did test it. And then they updated their security products. And the security product is able to feature or change the way a particular feature worked. Or a, and the thing they think they're catching, they're no longer catching. Right? So that's regression testing. Right? You need to go back and regression test the stuff that you've already done, not always just moving forward to new detections, validating that the things you think work still work. Right? So that kind of highlights that last bullet there. So the order of preference right? in the, in the ER, right? God, that, that is really weird to say. I actually hadn't said it a lot prior to this presentation, but uh, anyway, in the EER. Um, so in version one, uh, basically we're balancing usability versus risk. And as we look down the uh, kind of down the way there, that's the list of exclusions. I'm going to walk through these and why they matter, right? And so I tried to make an equilateral triangle, and I was like, I'm going to color it all great and whatever. Um, and, and then I had a co-author uh, with me here uh, who helped me uh, build different versions of this, right? So um, this one, interestingly enough, is not an equilateral triangle. Um, I was going to ask folks to vote on which one, which one was their favorite, right? This one's not an equilateral. Um, this one is, is just weird colors. I say weird, right? But I, I was trying to go with like support, right, on the pride flag side. And right? I was like, yeah, that seems cool, right? And then, and then we got the interesting color palette there, and that was cool. This one, incidentally, is, is the Tower of Hanoi, and I thought that was interesting also, right? So, um, but, but I did appreciate the help. This is a ton of help um, in, in trying to uh, build out a better, a better graphic, because as you'll note here, I'm not a graphics artist, and uh, I, I absolutely should have um, called a graphics artist um, and paid them to, to put something prettier together. Um, it was only in the, I don't know, we'll call it in the last... Uh, 72-ish hours, right, that I realized that, you know, the, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to do the pride flag colors. Well, it turns out there's only six colors and there were nine exclusions, right? And so I, I suddenly had a problem, right? Um, and I am not an artist, right? And I think you can see that. Anyway, uh, so let's get to the actual meat of this instead of the, the weird diagrams. And I'll start with, the, <clears throat> start with the, the cream of the crop here, and it's file hashes, right? File hashes are the most specific exclusion possible. They should always be preferred when you have the ability to exclude by hash. Most endpoint protection solutions do allow you to exclude by hash. Now, there's obviously a very low chance of bypass, uh, near zero, with, with modern hashing algorithms. I'm going to talk quickly about hashing algorithms, because people jump up and down like, Jake, MD5 is insecure. And I'm like, what does that mean? And they're like, it means it's insecure. And I'm like, right, what does that mean? Right? Like, SHA-1 is insecure, and I'm back to the what does that mean, right? Okay, right? So um, a lot depends on, we should not use SHA-1, by the way, for cryptography, right? Um, we shouldn't use even MD5, definitely not MD5 for cryptography. Uh, but, uh, you know, for instance, if we're using a signature, right, a digital signature, and the certificate um, is uh, backed by, you know, an MD5, uh, you know, basically an MD5, uh, some there to, to validate that that certificate was appropriately signed. Yeah, that's a bad plan, right? Even a SHA-1 is a bad plan. You cannot meaningful, meaningfully create uh, collisions with executables using SHA-1. You just can't meaningfully do it, right? So a SHA-1 hash, you're just not, if you have a SHA-1, yes, not good for cryptography, just fine for an endpoint exclusion, right? So a threat actor is not going to be able to create a working executable that has the same SHA-1 hash as the thing you excluded. If it's SHA-256, they definitely can't. And if they, if they could, if they could suddenly create SHA-256 you know, collisions, right, meaningfully, uh, Bitcoin would cease to be. Right? I mean, that's the level of security we're talking about here. Right? Now, whether or not that needs to happen anyway is a whole different debate. But Bitcoin would cease to be. Even MD5, right, realistically, creating meaningful collisions across MD5 uh, with, X, again, Creating a collision, an arbitrary collision, game on. A collision that executes, not at all trivial, right? So not at all trivial and probably okay here. Now, of course, one of my big problems, and I shouldn't say one of my big problems, the biggest problem with this is the exclusion has to be updated itself, right, with every software update. I will note here as well that fuzzy hashes, sometimes people bring these in. First off, um, it turns out that most of, your, uh, you know, most of your endpoint controls don't support fuzzy hashes anyway. For those not familiar with what a fuzzy hash is, um, it's really a blockwise or piecewise hash, right? Um, so basically, you're, instead of 
you know, you change one byte, for instance, in any file, it gets a brand new MD5, right? A blockwise hash actually goes through a fuzzy hash, as most people like to call it. Um, and basically, it goes through and hashes the blocks individually using lots of math, generates a very long string, um, much longer, in fact, than like an MD5 or a SHA-1, so that you can compare two files based on the hash and say 99% or 40% or whatever of the blocks in this file are identical. By the number, this drives me nuts where people will be like, Jake, that file's 99% identical. I'm like, that's not at all what it says, right? What it says is 99% of the blocks are identical, right? So one byte change in one block moves the block. Anyway, so fuzzy hashes, really useful for offline analysis. I use these, use these in forensics a lot. Um, these are horrible, horrible for real-time detections, and they're generally not supported for exclusions. They are super, super, super heavyweight when it comes to processor time, right? Now in forensics, I don't care because it's running offline. Right? So I've got a disk image, I've got a memory image, you name it, whatever, um, and I'm running fuzzy hashes across there. Also, when you start doing generally detections, I hate when people bring me indicators of compromise and it's a big list of hashes. Right? By the way, another quick rant on IOCs. When you get an IOC right, and somebody says, this is an IOC, the first thing you should ask is, what does it indicate? Literally, the word indicate is in the name. Right? What is this thing telling me? Right? And most often, people are like, badness. And I'm like, that is not context. It's just not context. So you should avoid generally hunting for bad hashes. One, it's a fool's errand, right? The reality is hunting for hashes in, or bad hashes, right, in some IOC list, it's a fool's errand. You're probably not going to succeed anyway. Um, and there are way better places to go and, and, and use your time. Hashes, by the way, coming back to the pyramid of pain, they're right at the bottom of the pyramid of pain, right? So don't hash hunt generally, but hashes for exclusions. If, the, if that particular product isn't updating a lot, this is as good as it gets. Second best is digital signature. Now, I'm going to come back around and talk about this a little bit, but the road is littered with bodies of folks that just trust digital signatures. If you start taking a hard look at how your security products actually test a particular digital signature, it's horrifying. The shortcuts that they take are absolutely horrifying. So before you use digital signature exclusions, you should absolutely evaluate how your particular security product validates that particular signature and what, val or, excuse me, what uh, fields they're using. Uh, just talk to your TAM. Get it in writing from them. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna immediately know, but they'll go, your technical account manager, TAM, is gonna go back to their engineering team they're going to get the answer for how this stuff actually works. You won't have to reverse engineer the, uh, the product and break your end user license agreement and all that, right? But uh, again, they vary wildly, just wildly. And a lot of them introduce a lot of opportunity for bypass. And like I said, I'll come back around to this. Um, now, my biggest problem with this, again, is that not all my security controls will support an exclusion for a particular digital signature, right? Um, <clears throat> I do also want to note here that if you are threat modeling against no joke nation state actors, right? So um, realistically, that means that you work in government, defense, big financial services like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, American Express, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and then probably insurance and healthcare, right? Th th those are really the big sectors that I worry about that are being targeted by no joke. I mean, probably a little bit of, you know, research and development type stuff, but but look, generally, the majority of us sitting in the room here today, you are probably not being targeted every day by a nation state threat actor, right? That said, there's no way to tell, right? But, but I do want to throw out here and note that, you know, there are some industries where you can just step back and say, I need to really engineer every day and think about this. And, and others where you can kind of step back and say, the odds are better that some script kitty gets into my network, and that's where I need to be focusing my time, right? Um, so anyway, uh, nation state threat actors have a history of stealing digital certificates so that they can go sign their malware, right? Um, and even stealing the right digital certificates so they can go sign their malware. And so there are a number of different published, uh, published examples of this. Um, I, I'm told that there are many more that are a little bit less published. Um, and so, yes. Anyway, uh, so next down the way here, we started with our, our file hash, digital signature, and then we have our custom signature match, right? So if, for instance, you have Yara, Right? Um, again, this is something that's going to be far more flexible for you than hashes or digital signatures. Right? Um, another big thing with digital signatures, by the way, is I may be trying to go and... Uh, I didn't even put this in a drawback, but I probably should have. Some software that I'm getting a false positive around isn't signed itself. Right? So I can't write an exclusion with digital signatures if the software isn't signed itself. Right? 
Um, but with a custom match with the R rule, I have full flexibility. All right? I'm in control of writing that R rule. Um, it's not dependent on the excluded software being digitally signed. Um, now, of course, from a drawback standpoint, um, number one, the road, again, is littered with bodies right, that have written horrible Yara rules. Nessus, by the way, actually has a Yara plugin, right, where you can go and run, like, along with like, your EDRs, or most EDRs, right, we can go scan an endpoint using Yara rules. You probably should not do this, right, or at a minimum, you should absolutely test this a lot right, before you end up with a resume updating event right, uh, where you deploy a very complex or very process or have a Yara rule that takes systems out of production, right? So, um, and I say complex, right, that's not looking at the rule and saying like, well, how complex does this rule look, right? It's about testing it against your environment. I'll also throw out here, coming back to the, the lack of detection engineers, most of our teams don't have people in-house that can write good signatures anyway. Poorly written signatures, um, they, they may actually be the least, sec the least secure exclusion, right? Again, if I write, for instance, I know we laughed all about the, uh, <coughs> You know, I know we laughed about the, uh, uh, certainly the uh, excluding star.exe, but what if you wrote a, you know, a custom Yara rule where you said, well, look at byte offset zero, right, in the file, and look for hex, what, uh, 4D, 5A, right? I mean, certainly that's better, right? Except that's MZ at offset zero, right? MZ, which is every executable, right? So we've just done the same thing, except we're higher up, right? higher up the order of exclusions. So really, really poorly written signatures, right? again, can sometimes be, be worse than no signature at all. I'll never forget the work that I was doing on the network side here, and I'm coming to the network side, uh, on a big incident response. Um, I had a, a gentleman who, man, he was like wildly certified, like had a bunch of, you know, I think, I don't know, 10 industry certifications, and you know, um, he, he made it through the tech interview okay, and then we were like right into an incident response. Dude was actually a SANS community instructor. Like I just kind of took for granted like this dude knew what he was doing, right? This guy's GCIA, and I think he was actually like in the community program teaching the, the 503 course, right? So I'm like, heck yeah, we're in this incident response, we're looking at this custom command and control, right? And I'm like, dude, I need you to write, you know, we, we know where the IP address is for, for the C2 server. I'm like, dude, I need you to write an IDS signature, a snort signature, right? Um, so that we can go apply that and see if there's another command and control server we haven't seen yet, right? This weird custom protocol, I'm like, hey, go find the invariance in the protocol. And almost two days later, right, and, and I, I thought he was actually working on something else. Like, I wasn't waiting two days for a snort rule. I legitimately thought he was helping with other stuff. He comes back and he's like, Jake, I've got the snort rule and it's good. I'm like, awesome. And I look at it. And I kid you not, it was looking at the destination port. So we'd done a big byte offset into the TCP header. He's like, yeah, so this offset into the packet, you're going to find these bytes always. I'm like, dude, that's the destination port. I'm like, you took two days to write a snort signature, right? That literally, like, this big byte offset in the hole. And I'm like, no, like, it was gone, like, gone, right? By the way, certifications don't mean a thing. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> so alas, uh, many endpoint security controls don't support using Yara rules or any type of custom language there. But again, I want to come back around to the whole, like if you write a bad, you write a bad signature, right? An overly broad signature, this can be absolutely the worst security exclusion. You'd be shooting yourself in the foot, right? You're thinking you're doing great, and in fact, you're, you're, you're doing horrible, right? So we have file metadata. This is a bit fragile. It's easily tampered with, but, but it does offer additional selectors for exclusions, right? Um, you know, the, the benefits here as we move down, it's basically it's better than the thing below it very often, right? Because this is not a good plan. In fact, as we move down the, the list here, I like to refer to the movie Argo. Has everybody seen Argo? It is a fantastic movie. If you've not seen Argo, you owe it to yourself to see it. I think it's on Netflix. I don't remember. Something like that. Um, but uh, in any case here, I'm not going to ruin the movie for everybody here. And the ones that have seen it, I'm not going to recount the whole movie. But there's a spot where, you know, in the movie where the CIA is basically going in to rescue, going into Iran uh, covertly to go rescue a bunch of American hostages. Um, and uh, they brief this very audacious plan. And the State Department uh, person in charge of, like, you know, greenlighting the plan says, that's a horrible plan. And without missing a beat, the CIA supervisor says, sir, this is the best bad plan we have. And I think about this all the time, right? One, because I spent 18 years in the intelligence community and I've had that conversation before where it's like, what are we going to do? Well, this, right, that's a bad plan. I'm like, oh, that's the best bad plan we've got, right, kind of thing. Um, but, but also, 
Also, it reminds me a lot of information security. I don't think I've ever gone to work one day in my life in cybersecurity and done the best thing. I don't think it's ever happened, right? I go to work every morning with the aspiration of doing the right thing, of doing the best thing, right? And then reality slaps me in the face and it's like, right? Just jumps in there, it's like, wow, right? And then I'm like, okay, well, and now I'm executing the best bad plan, right? So sometimes this is the best bad plan, file metadata, right? So what am I talking about here? Something as simple as a publisher name, right, in the executable manifest, right? Um, now again, trivial, I know, some folks are like, wait, that's trivially easy to bypass. Yes, it is, right? I do want to throw out here that advanced threat actors have no problem bypassing this, but I also want to highlight if they know about it. If you want to keep nation state threat actors up at night, and I speak as a former nation state threat actor, if you want to keep nation state threat actors up at night, write custom detections. They have entire testing labs full of whatever product you have, right, and all of the out-of-the-box rules. And they know, they know, before they go execute an action, whether or not they're going to get caught. Because they know. They know your tool, right? They don't know your custom rules. And there's always that little thing in the back of your mind, right, when you go press enter and you're like, well, I think this is going to work. Everything I know about this environment says this should work. Everything I know about this tool says I shouldn't get caught. But if these guys have custom rules, I'm hosed. Right? And so, again, if you want to keep them up at night, write some custom rules. Now, again, with perfect knowledge and understanding, right? again, this is trivially bypassable. Right? But again, if your threat actor doesn't know about the rules that you've put in place, right? then again, this can be a, uh, you know, metadata exclusions can, can be really, really effective, right? Now, again, the idea is I've created a rule that is generating too many false positives, or an out-of-the-box rule is generating too many false positives, and here I may be able to use, for instance, the metadata, the publisher, right? The, even the copyright data, in one case I used, right, um, to, uh, to basically exclude. And so, again, <clears throat> my drawback here is there's only a handful of endpoint security controls on the market that, that actually can read executable metadata, right? So, Wah, wah, wah. But again, as you're talking to your TAM, right, your technical account manager, say, hey, I need more capabilities. Right? Um, so I don't want to use this by itself. Ideally, I'm combining this with other elements in the, in the EER model. There's also the full file name and path. Right? So this is better than, <laughs> better than either the file name or the path by itself. Um, I will mention here, this does prevent a lot of DLL sideloading attacks. I have lots of threat actors, lots of threat actors that will basically uh, bring, actually the Chinese threat actors, are, are they're just all over this. They've been all over this for a decade and we still suck at detecting it, right? They will bring a legitimate digitally signed executable, benign, totally benign digitally signed executable, and they'll add it to your auto runs, right? They'll add it to your services, they'll add it to auto runs, whatever, they put it in some, in some directory, usually some program data. I see these in program data and subdirectories of program files all the time. And it's legitimate digitally signed executable, right? When it goes and launches, it sideloads a DLL, right? And we say sideloading a DLL, basically we're abusing DLL search order, uh, basically the uh, DLL search order. Um, and Windows, by default, looks in the current directory, right? So the directory where the executable resides for their DLLs first. Now, there's a bunch of weird rules with something called known DLLs. We're not going to deep dive there. My point being here that they're loading up a copy of a legitimate, a copy, a DLL with the same name as the legitimate DLL, right? So uh, WinMM, so the Windows Multimedia uh, DLL, WinMM.DLL, I see it sideloaded all the time. And there are dozens of other frequent flyers there, right? So again, this can prevent some attacks like DLL sideloading. I will mention here that weak file system permissions or admin permissions render this just relatively useless because once a threat actor can write wherever they want, uh, this becomes a little bit it becomes a little bit, little bit less useful, right? But, but if you have weak file system permissions, by the way, you were already owned, right? I mean, let's, let's be clear about this, right? If, if you have poor file system permissions, uh, realistically, your, your threat actor getting in as a regular user has already elevated to admin. Um, they're able to write whatever they want, and they've probably disabled your endpoint detection anyway, right? Um, so that's another point, by the way, that once your threat actor has a system, uh, system privileges on a uh, system privileges on an endpoint. Um, all of this is out the window, right? So detection engineering should be designed to stop them from getting there, right? That 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 should be our goal. Um, so 
As we move down beyond uh, full file name and file path, then we have just the file path, all right? So exclusions that rely only on our file path should be a relative last resort. And you should make the path as specific as possible, not something like C users, right? I've seen that one too, right? So like, oh, if it's running on users, it's good. And I'm like, out of downloads? And they're like, well, no, not that. I'm like, well, okay, that seems like a, you know, it's a problem here. Um, so the benefits are that this really does support these pesky applications that update all the time but aren't digitally signed, right? So um, a couple of great examples of this, WebEx, WebEx meeting. I hate WebEx meeting. It's like a rootkit, right? Um, but, uh, but alas, it updates all the time, right? And often isn't digitally signed. And I know Cisco would like to argue with me about this, but I have lots of evidence to the contrary, right? By the way, too, it doesn't matter how often they miss digitally signing it. If they do it once, it's still breaking the messaging application and the meeting application that my executives use and I can't have that, right? And so suddenly now I can't do it by, I can't create the exclusion by digital signature. I then have to go to file path, right? Again, I want to be very specific there, right? I want to put it in C users, whatever, app data, roaming, Cisco, WebEx, and then, you know, the full path, right? Um, again, this is something threat actors are absolutely going to capitalize on because they know where we have these problems too, right? If you're a red teamer in the audience, I suspect you're, you're already thinking, you're like, Jake didn't mention Teams. Not yet, not yet, don't, don't worry, right? So Teams says this too, by the way, except Microsoft is a lot better about consistently digitally signing it. Um, so then we have file name, right? So moving down the list a little bit, uh, only exempting by file name. This is so easy, a caveman can do it. Um, it's also so easy to bypass, a caveman can do it, right? This reminds me of the, you know, the early 2000s, right, with service host. It used to be that if if you wanted to, uh, you know, wanted to persist on a system and wanted to make sure that nobody would ever touch your malware, you just named it service host. Because there were more than a couple of those things on the system and everybody knew that if you terminate a service host, you're gonna have a bad time, right? And then we got smart about security and we started learning that, by the way, has anybody looked at how many service hosts are on a Windows 10 machine now? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's better for security, but oh my gosh, I feel like I can hide in the noise there generally now pretty easily, but, but alas, Again, we don't want to get back to the whole like, oh, well, that's a good, that's a good executable name, so it's just okay, right? Um, at that point, I'm kind of like, yikes, yikes, right? And then there's the file type, right? So exclusions that rely on a file type, and I want to be clear here, file type is not a file extension, right? We're actually reading into the file itself. This can be an option on some platforms. Again, there's only a handful of platforms that support this. It is more robust than file extensions, right? So there is some internal consistency check that takes place. By the way, speaking of file headers here, right? If you want to go mess with forensic software, right? Or you think that you'll ever be investigated by, I don't know, whatever, law enforcement or something, and you want to mess with their forensic software, go create a bunch of text files and, and the beginning of the text file, right? Maybe script this in Python or Ruby or whatever, but literally just put MZ at the beginning of it, right? And so NCase will go, NCase is used almost exclusively, well, I was gonna say almost exclusively by law enforcement, but it's the opposite, right? Most law enforcement almost always use NCase. But what I love about this is they go through and they're like, ah, you know, processing the disk image, and it's like all these executables, right? And of course, none of them are real executables, right? And then you get a chance at, you know, a trial or whatever to be like, oh, well, you know, they show file counts and different, and you can do this with more than just the MZ, by the way, right? But, but again, creating lots of fake files that get, that get picked up as the other thing. But, Typically here, what we're looking at is moving into the file, reading the file header, right? Um, so here, typically, um, my primary use case for this is when an AV definition file is generating false positives. Now, I know what you're thinking, like, why would the antivirus signature its own file? What I see, unfortunately, is a lot of organizations who have three or four different endpoint security controls, right, employed on the same endpoint. Without talking about whether or not that's stupid, um, Without getting into whether or not you should do that, right? Um, you definitely shouldn't, by the way, um, or at least not without you know, them working heavily together. Uh, you know, the, the reality is that, that if that is the way the organization is gonna work, um, the antivirus signature files have themselves, a lot, or endpoint protection signature files, have themselves, as the name implies, signatures in them, right? And as it turns out, your other controls look and say, hey, that's bad, right? If you can look at the header, of that file, you can turn around and say, oh, okay, we know that every time Defender releases an update, it has the following eight byte signature at the beginning of the file. And you can say, now ignore that, that's a Defender update, right? So that's the idea. Now, 
I will note here that very few file types are completely good or bad, right? Again, we should not do this as something like an a Windows executable, something like an antivirus signature, again, this becomes a primary use case for. And finally, file extensions, right? So if we have an exclusion that relies exclusively on file extensions, this should be a last resort. I mean, again, just a last resort. Um, I will mention here that, that this actually solved my healthcare problem. Um, the, when I was working with the, uh, with the healthcare org, I, I wrote a signature. Um, they were getting hit by some malicious uh, Word documents, Office documents. And uh, if you've looked at Office documents, uh, not the XML ones, right, but the, the older ones, the .doc, .xls, it's actually something called an Olay2 file, right? So o Olay being object link embedding. Um, and uh, it turns out that, that Office is not the only thing that uses Olay files. And I had signatured, I had done what the, the guy I was picking on before did, I signatured on a piece of the Olay2 file format. And it turns out that in healthcare, you move lab results around in an Olay2 file format called DICOM a lot, right? Now at the time, I was aware of DICOM files, but I was blissfully unaware of the fact that DICOM files were themselves Olay2, or we'd have tested this a lot, right? So, <clears throat> yes. Anyway, um, so this became a great use for this, right? I had a signature that was looking for something, right, something very specific right? um, in uh, the way a particular Olay2 or set of Word documents that was basically what we were signaturing on was a set of documents being malicious documents being created by, by some builder program, right? And it was creating a signature that didn't look anything like our generic office documents that you would get like saving a Word doc or a PowerPoint or whatever. And we looked at a whole corpus of these documents, right, both publicly available, internally available, you name it, and we're like, nope. The only time we ever see this is these malicious documents, and they clearly are being built by, you know, some, some external application. And I'm like, game on, right? And so we signatured on that, again, without realizing that it was part of the OLA2 file format, and that this laboratory producer was using whatever library the threat actor was using to build their files to. And so, so again, huge losing move there. But what we were able to do then was quickly say, but if it has a .dicom extension, I don't care. What was it? Right? So, so again, that particular use case worked out fantastically. It turns out, well, I was going to say .com files don't have any, any uh, dynamic code in them like macros, but, but generally that wasn't our, our threat model. Right? So it was there, pretty easy, to, uh, pretty easy to exempt. I will also notice here that shell handlers, right? so when you go double click on something, your shell handler takes over. Your shell handlers care about the file extension, but practically nothing else does. Right? Um, so I, I want to note here, for instance, if you wanted to like load a DLL into memory, right? You don't have to name it .dll, right? You can name it .jake, for instance, and as long as the header is there, that's all that matters, right? The, the file format matters. Now, again, you know, double clicking on a, a doc, for instance, that's renamed, that's the shell is gonna take over there, right? So it's gonna look at the file extension. But otherwise, again, changing the extension is, is trivially, tri trivial to do, at least for executables. Now, I said I'd come back with some gotchas here, um, and uh, so, one of the biggest ones that I run into is digital signatures. And I have seen a huge range of validation failures when it comes to digital signatures. The biggest one is where it accepts any signature. It just looks and says, oh, is it digitally signed? Good, right? Now that's, that, that's obviously a huge problem. Um, another big one is that it doesn't actually validate the, the signing certificate chain, right? So um, here I'm actually creating a self-signed cert um, or I've got a yeah, I'm creating a self-signed cert there, um, and uh, basically populating the subject name um, without actually validating the signature. This is another fantastic one here, right? And so Kaspersky actually screwed this up a couple of years ago. Um, this is fantastic. Uh, it turns out that you could, man in any, you could man in the middle any network traffic from something running that Kaspersky endpoint product as long as your certificate said Kaspersky in it. The subject name of the certificate said Kaspersky in it, you were done. You were good to go, right? And again, this is because of you know, inspecting or validating digital certificates is expensive, uh, processor-wise expensive. And so again, they're gonna, yeah, um, basically they're gonna take, some, uh, take some, some shortcuts, right? The other big one here, and I wanna note this actually did happen, right? So like 10 years ago, right? 10 plus years ago. So it's still happening now, by the way. Um, but you accept a signature with a known weak algorithm like MD5, right? And so uh, this is well within the realm of nation states to do. It was well within the realm of nation states to do more than a decade ago, right? Publicly, more than a decade ago, right? So you better believe it's still happening. To, I, I don't know that it's happening today, but I can't imagine that they're like, 
well, that worked so well, we should never do it again, right, kind of thing. I, I highly doubt that that occurred, right? Um, so another big one's file paths. And I said I'd come back to Teams, right? Um, so again, if you know that you have a, a file path where you have constantly updating software in, right, um, and you're going to write an exclusion for that, you better believe that your threat actor knows it too, right? Any red teamer knows this as well. So be judicious about creating too many exclusions um, with or exclu exclusions for too many paths overall. And when you do, supplement that with some additional detections, right? Because you've created at this point a, a, a you know, basically a hole in your defenses. Don't make that a hole big enough for your threat actor to drive a truck through, right? So to wrap everything up, to close everything up here, um, you know, again, I, I want to note here that exclusion shouldn't be a dirty word in detection engineering. I know a lot of folks are like, no, you're, you're writing, you're doing bad work, so you're using exclusions. Not at all, right? And sometimes exclusions are the best plan that we have. I don't even want to call it the best bad plan. What I'm really looking at here is that I have limited time. I want to do more detection engineering, right? And in order to do more detection engineering, I have to get, I have to get through my detections quickly, right? Or my signatures quickly. And sometimes that means writing exclusions. Now, the cost of bad exclusions is ridiculously high, right? Um, it's too high to get it wrong. Um, and again, I will throw this out here and say, even if all this seems obvious to you, right? If, if you're trying to argue with somebody, like for instance, hey, this is a better exclusion, being able to point back to a model, not the Tower of Hanoi version, by the way, right? But, but pointing back to the model, right? Um, will we'll be able to uh, basically help you prioritize overall, right? So anyway, appreciate your time. Hopefully this helps. I'll post the slides on my GitHub um, and tweet out a link to those. I'm Malware Jake on Twitter, um, and I think I'm right out of time. Do I have time for questions or no? We could do a few. Uh, I can one, do a few. Yeah, one person in Discord asked uh, if this is published anywhere. The EER, is that? Yeah, not yet. So I've got a white paper, and the like I said, I'm going to throw that up on the GitHub and tweet the link out in like five minutes. Right? So, so five minutes uh, well, to be published. Five minutes as, as based on when I get back to like a seat <laughs> and, and stop answering other questions. But five minutes after that, it'll be live, on, and, the, and the tweet will go out. So yes. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Um, so yeah, any questions? Any questions yeah. anywhere? Sir, in your judgment in the DICOM scenario, do you think the attacker was aware that you guys were using it, or is that just blind luck? Yeah. So the question is, in the DICOM scenario, do we think the threat actor was was aware we were using it, or was it just dumb luck? Um, no, I, I just dumb luck, entirely dumb luck. Like it, it's, yeah. I, I think that they, I I think it was highly unlikely. Actually, I can say 100% that they didn't know because I saw that same signature in non-healthcare environments. DICOM is uniquely a healthcare. Uh, I think is uniquely used by healthcare organizations, right? So, yeah, good question though. That was it's actually a really good question. Anybody else? Okay, well, thanks for. Oh, sir. So you're saying if Windows itself checks the digital signature versus your product? Oh, the product's relying on Windows. Oh, baby. Yeah, there's definitely. If the product itself, if your endpoint security product is relying on Windows through the digital signature validation versus writing its own code, yeah, absolutely there are weaknesses there. But I do want to throw out and note that um, for those weaknesses to be present, the threat actor would already have to have system level permissions on the endpoint. And at that point, they can do anything they want to bork the endpoint detection, right? So it, it's kind of a, a chicken egg, you know, chicken egg problem. But, but, but to your point, yeah, absolutely. Yep. yep. Okay, with that, thanks for coming. All Appreciate right. your time. Yeah.